Good afternoon. I'm Chris Fant. It's a pleasure to welcome you to our Asthma Grand Rounds today. And a special pleasure to introduce our speaker. Uh, it's with considerable pride and no small degree of amazement that I say that I have known Dr. John Godleski uh, as a colleague here at the Brigham for more than 35 years. He has, as you know, uh, directed the uh, pulmonary pathology section here at the Brigham for decades and at the same time has pursued his research interest into the pulmonary and systemic effects of ambient air particles. Uh, he is professor uh, in the Department of Environmental Health at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health and he is professor of pathology at Harvard Medical School and we're delighted to have him come to us today to talk about air pollution and asthma. Dr. Godleski. Thanks, Chris. Uh, the, uh, this, uh, this first slide has a number of uh, the, the logos of uh, the medical school, the Brigham, and the School of Public Health. My wife always says I have two full-time jobs in pathology here at the Brigham and uh, my role at the School of Public Health. Uh, this year I've been teaching in foundations at the medical school and I feel like I have three full-time jobs. But uh, with the, today's talk, I'm going to be uh, focusing on my role as, uh, as in the Harvard Clean Air Center, supported by EPA at the School of Public Health, and uh, involvement as a director of the Ambient Particles Research Corps at, uh, again, the NIEHS Center for Environmental Health at uh, the School of Public Health. And uh, with, with all of that, I have uh, no commercial uh, relationships to declare. Uh, the overview of this presentation will be, uh, first, a discussion of air pollution. I want to talk a little bit about the Clean Air Act and air pollution control, and really what's been accomplished. I'll move from that to uh, the asthma air pollution relationships of the, these been assessed scientifically through the last 50 years, uh, then focus on current issues addressed in studies of the asthma air pollution relationship. And uh, finally, I'll end up talking about approaches, findings, and contributions uh, from our lab to these, uh, this whole field. So starting out, what is air pollution? And air pollution simply is a mixture of gaseous and particulate components that come into the air from many sources. This mixture can undergo chemical reactions in the air and produce secondary air pollutants. And secondary air pollutants can be very important. Gases, uh, the gas ozone is, is a secondary air pollutant that comes from these reactions. Also, particles are formed and, uh, uh, in these kinds of reactions. And, and you'll see a lot of this uh, when we get to uh, talking about uh, my research. Air pollution can travel long distances. And uh, usually how air pollution gets cleaned from the air is by rain or snow. And um, usually after it's, after it's rained, uh, air pollution will be, uh, be quite low. Uh, the gaseous components of air pollution include hydrocarbons such as methane, volatile organic compounds, carbon monoxide, sulfur compounds, nitrogen oxides, and ozone, the secondary pollutant. And sources for these include traffic and transportation industry and uh, the atmospheric reactions. Particulate components of air pollution uh, we have to think about primary emission particles from combustion processes such as smoke, vehicle exhaust particles, and resuspended dust particles by wind and other processes. And in the urban setting, really the, uh, the key, some of the key particulates that are resuspended are tire wear and uh, brake dust. So that uh, uh, these again relate to vehicular uh, uh, sources. 
Secondary particles form to the air from photochemical reactions, and primary particles are, are in gaseous particles are important. And for example, uh, from uh, coal fire power plants, sulfur dioxide uh, goes to sulfate, uh, nitrogen dioxides from vehicles uh, to or inorganic or organic nitrogen compounds, and uh, volatile organics uh, can react with both uh, uh, themselves as well as the uh, nitrogen oxides to form a secondary organic aerosol. And so if you look at the components by sources, for example, uh, from California, uh, if you go along here and look at each of these and, and drop out uh, waste uh, sources, uh, there's really still about two-thirds of, uh, of the pollution in that area is uh, from traffic and vehicles. If we go around the world, you can see that it varies. So that if we uh, look at Pittsburgh up in the corner, uh, there's a much larger amount of sulfate, which is shown in red, and so they're more affected by Midwest coal-fired power plants. But uh, the green and blue on, this, uh, on these maps are, uh, are vehicular traffic, and so it may be a little less than 50% in Pittsburgh, but you go to California, and it's greater, it's about two-thirds again. Uh, down in New York, it, sulfate differs in the winter and the summer, but traffic is making up uh, about 50%. You go to Europe, the same thing. Traffic is greater than 50%, and in the Far East in China, again, traffic is greater than 50% uh, than of, uh, of the air pollution. So why is particulate air pollution important? Well, in, if we look at historical events, there are actually three where people died, and you could see people are dying from the air pollution. Uh, the first was in Belgium in 1930. The second was in uh, Pennsylvania, in the little town of Denora, south of Pittsburgh. And uh, there, 20 people died, and uh, the... Uh, this, this is, there's a lot of government reports on this, but if you want to read a very interesting story, there's a book called 11 Blue Men by Burton Roche. It's a series of, of short stories about medical detectives uh, uh, stories that were originally published in The New Yorker. Uh, the one about uh, Donora is called The Fog, and it's an incredible description of the respiratory distress, the cardiovascular distress of people uh, who were exposed to this pollution. And finally, in 1952, in, uh, in London, there was a similar uh, inversion where people died and uh, 4,000 people uh, were, died in relationship to uh, this air pollution event. So these were uh, the big events where you could actually see people dying. If you go to Denora, there's this uh, historical sign that uh, points out that major federal clean air laws became a legacy of this environmental disaster that focused national attention on air pollution. And it goes on to describe in a little more detail exactly what happened. Uh, but that was October 1948, and uh, the legacy took uh, actually 15 years before anything was done uh, at a federal level. And so in 1963, uh, the Congress established a research program through NIH that included the NIEHS uh, Center Program. And our, our center at, at uh, HSPH uh, has the number ES, a bunch of zeros, two. And that's because it was the second grant uh, ever given by NIEHS. And it's still, uh, it's still being funded. So in 1963, they have established a research program. In 1967, this was actually the first Clean Air Act. 
Uh, but all it established was a framework for monitoring air pollution. Uh, it, uh, it really didn't do much more. There are a lot of different federal agencies that were involved in, uh, in this monitoring. And then in 1970 were the Clean Air Act amendments. And we usually think of this as the Clean Air Act uh, because it established EPA, it brought all these various uh, agencies that were doing monitoring together and uh, created accountability and enforcement. So uh, this was uh, the, the first major step toward uh, a real uh, uh, system that would uh, uh, act toward cleaning up the air. In 1977, this was further amended uh, to assure maintenance of attainment. In 1990, amendments were added to regulate 190 different pollutants, getting closer to looking at, at specific sources and how they could be, uh, could be controlled. And it wasn't until 1997 that a standard was set for PM 2.5. And PM 2.5 is the uh, air pollution that gets into our deep lung. PM10 is everything less than 10 microns, and uh, for the most part, uh, uh, coarse particles that get filtered out in the nose, but it includes everything else down. Whereas PM2.5 are those particles that will get into the deep lung. And that standard wasn't set until 1997. And so since then, there have been uh, adjustments and uh, further tightening of the standards. But we can look at you know, what this accomplished. And so if we look at uh, what's happening in the United States from, uh, from, the, uh, from 1970, and this graph is to 2012, can show that uh, gross domestic product increased over 200%. Uh, the uh, vehicle miles traveled increased, the uh, population increased, energy consumption all increased, but uh, emissions of the six common pollutants actually decreased 72 percent. So that there's, there really has been environmental improvement uh, as, a, as, as a result of the Clean Air Act. If air pollution in the U.S. has decreased by 72% in 40 plus years, what's the bad news? And there's a lot of it. And the bad news is that increases in particulate air pollution within EPA standards for much of that time has been associated with acute cardiopulmonary deaths and increased hospital admissions, ER visits, so that there, there has been a problem even at levels inside that standard. Particulate air pollution has been designated as a carcinogen by IARC, especially applicable to diesel admissions. And uh, I think the recent Volkswagen cheating scandals relate, related to diesel admissions sort of make clear how much of a, an issue this can really be. Uh, it, most of you probably know uh, Volkswagen uh, had, has a system where their diesels uh, can be completely clean, but they also created software to, dis to disable that system and so that they get more power out of the car and better performance and uh, to hell with uh, the, uh, the air. And uh, that's uh, uh, what we're, we're facing in this year. To, to a great surprise, considering how much we now know about air pollution. But let's focus in on air pollution and asthma relationships through the last 50 years. Uh, one of the early reviews that I found with the same title as this talk, Air Pollution and Asthma, was in the Journal of Asthma Research in 1965. Interestingly, it was volume two. And uh, two people from Einstein Medical College in New York made the following statement. It would appear reasonable to suppose that among those who might be most susceptible to the aspiration, rather than inhalation, of pollutants 
would be those individuals who suffer from asthma. Well, there was no data, so that's the best they could do, was uh, to suppose at that point that probably uh, uh, going to be a problem. In 1994, there's another review, Air Pollution and Asthma, in postgraduate medical, the medical journal, not such a good journal, but uh, interestingly, it, it reflects pretty clearly the time. Now, 1994, it's a year after uh, Doug Dockery's paper appeared in the New England Journal on the uh, uh, the uh, six city study that showed increased uh, mortality uh, with particulate air pollution. And in a lot of uh, government committees and uh, in a lot of scientific sessions, the real issue was plausibility. And so uh, what was said in 1994 was the role of air pollution in the increased prevalence and morbidity of asthma has been widely debated. But results to date indicate that the normally encountered levels of air pollution are unlikely to contribute to a worsening of asthma. That was by Peter Barnes of the National Heart and Lung Institute in London. So there was a lot of skepticism. And uh, at the time, uh, starting about 1995, NIH through both the Heart Lung Institute, NIEHS, EPA all began major funding of, uh, of research in, uh, into, this, uh, into this issue. So that by five years later, another review with the same name uh, by Jane Koenig from uh, Seattle uh, pointed out, air, outdoor air pollution levels have been associated with a broad spectrum of adverse health effects in individuals with asthma. These effects are pulmonary function decrements, increased bronchial hyperresponsiveness, visits to emergency departments and hospital admissions, increased medication use and symptom reporting, inflammatory changes, interactions between air pollution and allergen challenges, immune system challenges. Pretty uh, complete list of what uh, can go wrong in asthma and uh, how the fact that there have been papers in the five-year period, just between 1995 and 99, that, uh, that showed uh, all of these effects. And th to a great extent, the, the, the papers were coming fast and furiously during that time. And uh, these were really all accepted findings. So what have we been doing for the last 15 years? Well. One of the things, if you also look at uh, images on the internet of uh, asthma and air pollution, you see a lot of graphs like this. And what this shows is that how steeply asthma incident prevalence is increasing. And it shows this idea that air pollution is decreasing. And this, this is data from California. You can find very similar graphs from uh, Europe and uh, from very many other, uh, other people. And uh, this is used to raise questions about, well, is there really uh, an interaction? I think we'll see a little later uh, how this might be explained. But let's, let's go to a more recent review uh, by John Balms from UCSF. And he makes a number of interesting points in, in, this, in, in this review in The Lancet in 2014. And now we're 15 years since the, la the last one that I pointed out to you. And uh, the first thing he points out is the traffic and power generation are the main sources of ur urban air pollution. So we've gone from this vague idea of air pollution now more distinct distinctly toward sources. The idea that outdoor air pollution can cause exacerbations of pre-existing asthma is supported by evidence, an evidence base that has been accumulating for several decades. And yeah, there's probably a thousand papers that uh, show all this, uh, the exact things that uh, Jane Koenig talked about. So for every one of those things, there's probably uh, a good 25 papers or more. And, uh, 
and then all of these are shown in uh, cities all over the world. However, he also points out, and this is, this is kind of the new point, with several studies suggesting a contribution to new onset asthma. So let's look at that. Uh, well, there are actually quite a few papers that show uh, asthma might, air pollution might cause new onset asthma in children. And there's a recurring theme throughout these papers. And that is that they, they all cite traffic-related air pollution as the, uh, as the component that's most associated with this. And so uh, Mike Jarrett looked at a pr prospective cohort and uh, found that was able to report this. Rich McConnell at Southern California looked at where the kids both lived and went to school, found uh, again a relationship with the uh, onset of uh, asthma in children or asthma symptoms. And uh, another one, traffic-related air pollution and incident asthma in a high-risk birth cohort from Mike Brower's group in Canada. And finally, the last one that I cite here points out that this problem might also be involved in minority children, uh, people of low socioeconomic status, which uh, is another important point. How about adults? Well, actually, there, there are a, a, a good dozen papers that show air pollution might cause new ad onset asthma in adults. Uh, and I picked out a few of them to point out that uh, the first one, uh, home outdoor NO2, uh, which uh, is a marker of, of traffic, a new onset of self-reported asthma in adults. Uh, Nino Kunzli, uh, another European study, traffic-related air pollution correlates with adult onset asthma among never smokers. A third, vehicle exhaust outside the home and the onset of asthma. And then a study from, uh, from the United States just came out uh, this year in uh, respiratory and critical care medicine that uh, shows that, again, NO2 as a marker of pollution is uh, exposure and incident adult asthma in this nationwide cohort. Uh, PM 2.5 was close to significant, but uh, not quite there. Again, pointing to traffic as the, uh, as the role. And uh, here's a, a graph familiar to Mary Rice uh, from our center. And uh, she looked at uh, lung function in the Framingham Heart Study cohort in relationship to distances to major road. And what she clearly showed was that if you lived uh, within a, a hundred meters of a major road, uh, your decrement in FEV was greater than, than 20 ml. If you uh, lived between 100 and 200, it was about 20. And uh, it, they, the control were those people who lived uh, greater than uh, or 400 to 1,000 away. So you can see how both FEV, FEV1, and uh, FVC were uh, decreased by living uh, close to a, a major road. So epidemiologic studies of asthma really have identified uh, traffic sources of air pollution as the most important. So what have been the, the approaches to divine traffic-related outcomes? In epidemiologic studies, uh, they've used black carbon, uh, they've used uh, NO2, and other markers of traffic. Residents near major roads, uh, including addresses, zip codes, uh, global positioning systems and satellite studies. Murray's was a satellite-based study uh, that uh, showed uh, how residents near major roads contributes to uh, the findings. So we've come a long way looking from, at air pollution from central monitors to now being able to look specifically in relationship to uh, where people live. 
Laboratory experiments used uh, pre-collected emissions from diesel vehicles. Also, uh, a number of studies have used single vehicles on a dynamometer where the exhaust goes directly to exposure. Others, uh, studies from Southern California, for example, moved ambient particle concentrators. These are devices that will increase the concentration of the particulate fraction in the air so that you can do experimental studies. They've been moved to near road locations to find uh, effects. We've taken a different source in our lab and we, in our approach. We go to the source, we study both primary and secondary particles separately and together so we can get a better understanding of these. And so what we do is we use mixed vehicular emissions that can be collected in real time from the ventilation system of a traffic tunnel. And we have lots of traffic tunnels in Boston. And uh, we look for a, tra a tunnel that rarely has traffic jams has a mixture of vehicles representative of urban traffic, and has almost the same traffic flow each day for reproducibility. So if you think about that, uh, which traffic tunnel would you want? 93 North? Probably not. It gets too many traffic jams. The one tunnel that doesn't have traffic jams is actually the eastbound lane of the Ted Williams Tunnel. Also, going to the airport has the same traffic flow every day with roughly the same cars, roughly the same trucks. And also, it, uh, well, it uh, is in a place where you, could actually, where you could actually use it. And so it has uh, not only representative urban traffic, but it also has reproducibility. So we want to study both primary particles and secondary particles, as well as the gaseous components. And then we want to compare these to other source emissions. So OK, here's the, uh, here's the, the tunnel system. And uh, no, I can't, oh yeah. If you look down near the road in the picture up at the corner, you see these little slits along the road. And that's where the air goes out from the tunnel. And notice that it's about a foot above the surface. You can look at these the next time you drive through the tunnel. And it's very, very close to where the exhaust comes out. It's close to where you find brake wear. It's close to where you find tire wear. And so if the air's going out there, where is it going? Well, the tunnels are really uh, tubes. Uh, and uh, the tunnel part of it that uh, you see in this picture is actually about a half, a, takes up about a half the tube, as I've marked with this square, square in there. And then the space above is all the plenum. And uh, that connects to these ventilation buildings. Now, if you look at this picture of a ventilation building, this happens to be the ventilation building we use, but uh, there are ventilation buildings all over Boston. And uh, they're in relationship to the tunnel. They're very nondescript. And basically, they're empty buildings where the air comes in and is, is both monitored and managed from the tunnel system. And so um, as the air comes up into the plenum and travels along and uh, essentially goes out through the ventilation building, and we have our laboratory in this ventilation building. And so what we have in our lab is a system where we can study both primary, secondary, and combinations of uh, particles. And so if the particles come in up in the upper corner there, and if we just take what's coming out, we put it into our chamber. And our chamber is actually eight meters uh, cubed. So it's a, it's a big chamber. And it has... Uh, lights around it so that we can simulate the sun. And uh, residents time in here for, for air going in uh, about 90 minutes. And then it comes out. It goes through a denuder where we, get, we can get rid of the, glass, the gases. And uh, then it goes to animals. So this is what it looks like. Uh, this is the, uh, the banks of lights around it. This is our 
eight cubic meter chamber, and uh, the walls of it are all Teflon, and they are like screen doors where we can just lay new sheets of Teflon onto the uh, screen door and so our particles won't stick to the side. And uh, that's our reaction chamber. This is a picture of our uh, denuder system. And uh, the denuder is down here. And how this works is that uh, the particles go through the center. There's a microporous Teflon uh, diffusion membranes all around it. And there's clean air going in uh, the opposite direction. So we, that draws out the gases, keeps the, the particles in, uh, in the manifold to go to the exposure chamber. OK, so what's the study design? Uh, we want to look at part mass concentrations for all exposures. And so we did some preliminary studies. And we found that we could make an aerosol of secondary particles about 50 micrograms per cubic meter. And so we targeted everything to start at that level. And so uh, all our exposure scenarios are assessed versus uh, filtered air control animals. Our primary traffic emissions uh, are done by just simply turning the lights off. And then as the particles come out, they go through the denuder to remove gases and go to the animals. If we want to study primary plus secondary, we just turn the lights on. We can remove the gases and study those, that combination. If we want to look at secondary particles alone, uh, we just put a filter in line to take out the primary particles before they get to the chamber, remove the ga excess gases, and look at our secondary particles. And then finally, we can look at uh, primary and or secondary with the gases. Uh, our, we do this five hours a day, four days a week, usually over three or four weeks. Uh, we do a lot with cardiovascular uh, instrumentation. I'm not going to talk about this. I'm going to focus more on the respiratory. And so we're using uh, whole body chambers as a, as a plethysmograph uh, to provide continuous measures of lung volume, flows, and, and breathing rates. Uh, the system looks like this, where uh, the animals are in these tubes where they're sitting on uh, receptors for the telemetry system for the cardiovascular outcomes. And uh, at the same time, uh, you can see the animal here in one of these plethysmographs and uh, uh, being, uh, being exposed uh, and sitting on the, uh, on the telemetry receiver. Uh, we have a, a mobile lab that's outside the building where the animals are, are housed, and uh, we also do, uh, we can do surgery there, we can do some of our analyses there as well. And so this is the uh, first study that was uh, uh, reported uh, by Edgar Diaz, and uh, what we found was that you can see that with all three exposures, the first being primary particles, the second being the secondary particles, and the third being the combination. Uh, we uh, did a number of exposures. Uh, we're pretty close to our target of 50 uh, in all of these. The other thing was that the particle size of, of these particles uh, was in the 300 nanometer range. That means they were uh, 0.3 microns, so that they were in the fine particle range, but in the lower end of it. And we also had particle numbers, and uh, you can see how uh, that they varied. Now, when we looked at the uh, breathing pattern of these animals, you can see with primary particles, the uh, minute volume is decreasing dr uh, dramatically uh, with uh, the peak expiratory flow is also down, starts out low and, and gets, and then kind of levels off, but really well below uh, the control animals. And, uh, and what I'm showing here is the difference between uh, the control animals and the animals getting uh, the exposure. 
and uh, then EF50 or the expiratory flow at 50%, uh, you can see again is decreased. So that's what we saw with primary particles. When we looked at uh, secondary organic aerosol or secondary particles, what we see is these are all reduced and all significant, <clears throat> but not quite as, uh, as, uh, effect, uh, as much of an effect as we could see with primary particles. So, uh, and the combination turned out uh, not to be uh, worse than the two together, but uh, kind of between the two. So that the, uh, the secondary particles didn't really uh, increase the effect. They uh, sort of uh, average the effect. And so again, these are all decreased but, uh, and all highly significant decreases. Now what about inflammation? Well, we looked at this two days after uh, the exposure. And when we looked at uh, primary particles, uh, we had an increase in lymphocytes, interestingly. Uh, at the same time, looking at uh, the uh, secondary particles, we had a, a very significant increase in neutrophils. And as you might expect, the combination increased both uh, lymphocytes and neutrophils. <coughs> So you can see that we had a, uh, a substantial effect different from in all three. And interestingly, when you think about this in relationship to what the uh, pulmonary function changes were, uh, you can see some interesting uh, parallels, but also what you predict would predict, although you might predict the primary particles to have a greater neutrophil response than what we, uh, we had seen. Uh, we looked at this over longer periods of time, 10 days of exposure. Looking at EF50, you can see that uh, uh, there's a decrement relative to control on each day of exposure. And it varies over time, but really doesn't change. So all three exposures produced a decrease in inspiratory, expiratory airflows and tidal and minute volumes. On BAL, SOA had increases in neutrophils, primary particles had increases in lymphocytes, and the combination increased both. We looked at this in comparison to power plants, and we did the same kinds of studies at uh, power plants, and uh, <coughs> we reported this in uh, a whole issue of the journal Inhalation Toxicology in 2011. We looked at three different coal-fired power plants. We had higher exposure in the range of uh, 300 micrograms per cubic meter. Um, <clears throat> and we needed this to produce a uh, lesser pulmonary effect uh, outcome in changes in airflows, volume, and BAL. So our conclusion were that uh, uh, certainly the traffic was more uh, uh, was more toxic. And these were the first toxicologic studies using a specific source of pollution. <coughs> Clinically and statistically significant outcomes were produced with the exposure dose of only 50 micrograms per cubic meter with traffic sources of pollution. And it established that vehicular pollution had greater toxicity than pollution from power plants. Uh, what about uh, the respiratory effects when gases are present? Do they increase? So we could do these studies with and without the denuder. <coughs> and what we're able to see here is that uh, CO and NO really don't change very much, but NOx that is consumed gets decreased more with the uh, denuder in place, which is the lower one and uh, ozone, which is about, that's parts per billion, it's pretty close to the 0.2 uh, ozone standard, uh, actually when the denuder is in place, drops down to 0.02. So uh, 
this is uh, really not at a level that's going to cause any effect. And uh, what we saw was that there were significant differences from filtered air controls with both treatment groups, uh, but there was no significant difference between treatment groups and flows, uh, volumes, or BAL cells. And the trends, again, not significant, suggested either absolutely no change or no difference, or possibly a slightly positive effect with the gases. And I think those of you that use either CO or NO clinically uh, are aware of both that uh, uh, at low doses their uh, uh, anti-inflammatory capabilities so that you can see why uh, that uh, the presence of these gases uh, either has no effect or a slightly positive effect. Uh, so what about air quality? Is it improving or not? When we uh, started looking at our, our studies, we realized that uh, our mass concentrations were dropping over the years. We started these studies in 2010, <coughs> and by 2013, we'd gone from 50 to 30 micrograms per cubic meter and particle mass. Particle number, however, uh, really didn't change very much. So when we look at our data, one of the interesting things is uh, the first column, and this is, uh, this is data from uh, 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 peak expiratory flow, that just looking at exposure or no exposure we had big effects at 50, and uh, you would think not so much at the lower doses. Uh, when we looked at it per, mi per 10 micrograms of PM 2.5, you can see that uh, we still have very significant effects, and uh, it's, uh, it's on a per microgram basis not much different. Uh, at the same time, though, when we looked at, uh, at it on a count basis, even this, uh, this peak that in 2012 was not significant either as a, as a simple comparison or as a, uh, per, on a per 10 microgram basis actually became significant. So it suggested that uh, although mass has decreased, particle number hasn't changed, and uh, pulmonary changes correlate best with particle number. Let me just point out that uh, this is the chemical composition of what these animals are exposed to. And if you look over at the pie chart, uh, the red in the pie chart is, is sulfur-based uh, 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 pollution, some of which could come from vehicles, but probably most of the sulfur comes from ambient air. In Boston, sulfur is about 50%, sulfate's about 50% in the winter, about 70% in the summer. In the tunnel, it's only 7%. So what we're seeing at the place where we're doing our experiments is that uh, we have almost all uh, traffic-related emissions. What about animal models of asthma and exposure to air pollution? Uh, studies done with ambient par Particle concentrators and pre-collected particles have used the albumin allergy model in mice and rats and generally showed uh, increases in, in uh, uh, negative effects as far as, the, uh, as far as pulmonary function is concerned and inflammation. Uh, uh, we've been interested in urban stress, the one, one epidemiologic uh, study that I pointed out showed uh, that uh, urbanization, stress, and, uh, and uh, living near urban uh, big roads, but also the stress can play a role. And we studied this back in 2010 with concentrated ambient particles using a social stress rat model. And what this is, is that we put an aggressive rat into the uh, cage with a, another rat as a stressed animal. And that stress then, along with pollution, 
has a greater effect than it, either of them alone. Has effects on blood pressure as well as on uh, pulmonary function. And I think this is a direction that we look to go in and we're hoping to get some grants funded in this area, but we haven't been successful so far. Um, but I think it's a very interesting model, very comparable to what we deal with. Uh, okay, let's look at what happened as a result of all the epi and tox research in terms of the bottom line. PM 2.5 and PM 10 have declined in the United States and, and Europe. Improvement in survival relative to decrease in ambient particulate was reported by Doug Dockery and Arden Pope in New England Journal in 2009. And in the past year, uh, the California group with Jim Goderman showed improvement in lung function growth in children. Again, a uh, New England Journal of Medicine uh, uh, report. So that uh, the decline in, in uh, uh, ambient pollution has had positive effects. In terms of diesel, uh, interesting study done from uh, the HEI ACES uh, study where they, in uh, the 1990s, they studied the effects of diesel exhaust on rats and found it to be carcinogenic. Uh, using v diesel vehicles meeting 2007 standards, uh, it was found to be no longer carcinogenic and in 2010 standards are even more strict, so it's unlikely to have an effect. That doesn't take into consideration what Volkswagen has been doing. But uh, still, uh, if, if the pollution control systems are left intact, uh, we can, we can uh, think in terms of diesel exhaust no longer being carcinogenic. If we look at national trends in the United States, we can see that uh, ambient PM 2.5 uh, from 2000 to 2010 has dropped. It's gone from about 13 micrograms per cubic meter down to around 10 and continued over the last five years as we've looked at uh, a number of our, our, our studies here. In Europe, you can see that it's at a higher level uh, looking especially at urban, but uh, they've, they've separated out rural, urban, and traffic related in this. Uh, and if we look at Europe, we can see that uh, some of Western Europe is actually very low, and much of the high levels are coming from uh, the former Eastern uh, Bloc countries in Eastern Europe. So that uh, I think there's... Uh, a good possibility for improvement in, in Europe. However, uh, other parts of the world are more, more concerning. We haven't had a real episode in the United States since 1948. But in 2013, 2014, 2015, uh, in various parts of China, uh, we've seen these air apocalypses where Pollution has reached uh, as high as a, a milligram per cubic meter, uh, exactly the same kinds of levels that were in Denora uh, back in the, the 1940s. Uh, if we go to Brazil and look at the city of Sao Paulo, uh, you can see this uh, nice blue sky, but then the visible layer of air pollution sitting over the city, and on this particular day, air pollution was at 100 micrograms per cubic, per cubic meter. We look at uh, the averages in San Paulo, they're up around 25 micrograms per cubic meter. And it's pretty flat compared to you know, where we are in the United States, uh, down, down around uh, 10 or 12. So it's really about two times the level that we're seeing. It's uh, really the same level in Sao Paulo as what we're getting from our, in our experimental animals these days in the tunnel. So uh, with that, let me close with some take home messages. And uh, the first is that there are primary and secondary forms of air pollution and they can have different effects. 
More than 50% of ambient air pollution in most cities comes from traffic sources. Traffic sources of pollution have adverse effects on asthmatics and appear to play a role in the induction of asthma in both children and adults. We have, a novel, we have novel approaches for experimental use of traffic derived air pollution and have observed acute air flow decrements and inflammation at very low levels of, in toxicologic, for toxicologic experiments. Uh, use of this exposure system with asthma models and other innovative biological approaches will have potential to improve therapeutic and preventive measures for asthmatics relative to air pollution. We hope that's the direction that we want to go, both in terms of understanding mechanisms of how some of these occur, how air pollution could affect the incidence of asthma. And finally, air pollution is decreasing in the United States and Europe, but traffic cost air pollution in emerging nations remains really at apocalyptic levels, and these need to be very high international priorities. And with that, I will take any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. It was a terrific and comprehensive <laughs> review. Thank you. I, I, your, your story reminds me of a story. Uh, I had a trip to LA once, got off the airplane, and the person next to me at the street side takes a sniff and said, oh my gosh, the air pollution in here is terrible, and then lights up a cigarette. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I wonder uh, uh, about relationship between air pollution, cigarette smoking, or a vulnerable population with COPD and the like. Uh, Ab absolutely. Um, they, you know, cigarette smoking dwarfs air pollution uh, in terms of uh, direct uh, effects on the lung, on the cardiovascular system, um, the causation of cancer. And I think that was kind of a, a long-standing issue that had made it difficult for people to see the signal of uh, air pollution in terms of its carcinogenicity, as well as in relationship to a lot of these effects. The other thing is that a lot of these effects are all worse in smokers. Some of the, the first studies that I did uh, were to uh, uh, make both rats and dogs uh, uh, with uh, essentially chronic bronchitis with very high levels of sulfur dioxide. And of course, with that, we had even greater effects. We also realized that with that that uh, we could use normal animals as we have in these studies and see these effects as well. So that uh, although the effects can be greater, uh, you can see the same thing with, uh, in, in normal individuals. And I think that's where a lot of this, uh, the whole idea of development of incident asthma and air pollution and what, how, how that mechanism takes place is not entirely clear yet, but there are a lot of issues being looked at and raised in terms of, and there's data out there to show that uh, the combinations of allergens and air pollution can contribute to that development. Yeah, Ed. Uh, hi, John. Um, you haven't mentioned yet, uh, but I presume it's a major factor with asthma, indoor air pollution, um, burning of a variety of fuels, et cetera. As you know, these are factors with, uh, with tuberculosis as well, outdoor pollution, indoor pollution, and smoking. But I'm wondering about asthma and uh, indoor air pollution. Yeah, the, the question is air, indoor air pollution and asthma. And uh, I'll, a lot of that, you know, we've, uh, we've used a variety of models for uh, uh, development of asthma. One is the, that, uh, uh, the ovalbumin model, but even a better model is using uh, uh, a cockroach dust and uh, also um, other uh, household dust as the, uh, as the inciting agent. So that uh, there's uh, also 
good, good, good data that suggests what happens indoors can contribute to, uh, to asthma. And a lot of this uh, really also relates to um, high levels of NO, NO, NO2 and NOx, basically, within the indoor environment. You know, we have gas stoves, we have uh, uh, gas fireplaces that uh, where, although they put out relatively small amounts of particulate, they put out a lot of NO2, and uh, this can certainly contribute. So that, that's one of the basis uh, for this, and uh, definitely indoor uh, uh, environments are important. I, I was thinking more of the uh, indoor uh, cooking fuels that are high particulate. Yeah, well, I, I mean, in, in uh, other parts of the world where you have open cook stoves, uh, it's been shown that, you know, if you put a chimney on the cook stove as opposed to leaving it uh, go right into the hut, uh, you change a lot of the uh, effects on the people in that, uh, in that hut where you'll no longer get the... Uh, 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 essentially decrements in FEV1 and other measurements of uh, chronic pulmonary disease. Yeah, Mary. Uh, thank you for your talk. Um, you know that the graph that you showed uh, showing the trends in air pollution over time with air pollution going down in most parts of the U.S. and asthma prevalence overall over the last few decades going up. As you might know, that graph has been used by many naysayers to say, look, how can there possibly be any association between air pollution and asthma at these low levels, given that asthma is going up? And I, I wondered if you had any comments on how that could be. Uh, yeah, well, I, I, think, I think where that fits in is that, uh, yes, we have mass going down, and uh, we have a lot of gases going down. Um, we're, to the extent that the gases coincide with particles, it's sometimes hard to disentangle them. In our studies, where we can add or, or, or take out the gases, uh, the particles seem to be the, the real driver. The other thing, the other takeaway from our studies is that uh, uh, we're using very small particles. And uh, although the one thing that you don't see on those graphs is actually what's happening to the small particles. And uh, uh, we've shown that here in Boston, although uh, the traffic-related uh, particles has, have almost gone down in half over five years. And if you think about that, you know, you look at all the uh, Toyota Priuses and uh, Toyota Camrys that are your taxi cabs these days. And, and back when we first uh, started those studies five years ago, uh, a lot of the taxi cabs were pre-2000 sedans falling apart and belching out smoke as they went down the road. Uh, so that uh, there's been a big change in the, uh, in the fleet and uh, there's been a change in what's uh, emitted and the trend is toward smaller particles being emitted and, uh, but, and so the numbers don't go down, they stay the same or they go up. So I think the fact that uh, we have more smaller particles, even though we have less mass, uh, is probably a good explanation for why that, uh, why that graph that the naysayers used, uh, use, and, uh, and it's one that comes up all the, to all the time. And, and there are lots of them. I just showed one example of one. But they all show the same thing. And uh, the one thing they don't show is what's happening to the uh, very small particles that are probably the, the greatest players in this. At least that's what our, our results show and su suggest. Yes? Um, in your studies, uh, once these animals are removed from the exposure, do any of these physiologic changes improve or reverse at all? Uh, they really don't, uh, because as we look at them, uh, as we go from, from day to day, uh, they, they certainly seem to be there. 
And I think we would, if they were to revert, it would take longer than what we've studied to see it. Okay. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you very much.